Hi guys, let's dig into a new problem that involves our vector math skills. Um, <clears throat> like I said, the vector math we've been doing in class is only good if it provides us with an easier way to solve new problems. So this is going to be your very first look at what we're going to call a two-dimensional uh, motion problem. And so it involves a lot of the skills that we used and developed in vector, our vector math section. So, um, take good notes, and we will work a lot with this in the coming day, um, in the coming week, and um, hopefully your uh, skill levels will develop over time. So, I would advise you first to read the problem. It's written in the email. Um, it deals with, as I've drawn a, a sketch of the scenario um, on the board, it deals with a uh, bird that is up in a branch on a tree, um, sees a fish down in the water below. Here's my fish. Here's my fish. And um, wants to eat the fish so that it can have dinner, I suppose. Um, very, I guess, common scenario, but um, it is what it is. Um, our bird flies at 3.1 meters per second at an angle below the horizon of 20 degrees. And this is sort of the new part because what we've been talking about so far have been, um, I guess, birds that only fly in one dimension. This is a bird that flies in two dimensions, probably like most normal ones. Um, it is 19 and a half meters up in its tree before it um, flies straight at the uh, fish in the water. And what we'd like to know are two things. One, how long it takes the bird to get to the fish, and two, how far in the horizontal direction the bird has traveled when it has arrived at the fish. So, let's dive into this a little bit and start to understand how two-dimensional motion actually works. Um, what you can see in the setup to the problem is that the bird is going to move in this diagonal direction so that it eventually comes and meets the fish at this point. Um, if you thought about it this way, this is sort of a breakdown of how we can also view the motion. The bird, as it flies this way, sort of diagonally, if we were to track that motion in the, let's say, vertical direction as we go, and what I mean by that is this. As the bird flies this way, if I were to keep another finger here at the same height as the bird, what I would have essentially is tracking in my left hand what we could call the velocity of the bird in the y direction. In other words, how fast is the bird moving only in the down direction? That's different than saying how fast is the bird moving. The bird's moving at 3.1 meters per second. But as it falls, it's only going straight down at a speed that is different than that. That speed is less than 3.1 meters per second because it's not in that same direction. There's also a speed of this object as it moves horizontally across the um, front of the uh, front of the um, horizontal piece here towards the fish, and that direction is another one we can break down. If I were to track that across my finger, my finger can move where the bird is, and then my right hand represents the motion in the horizontal direction. Hi, Mr. Gasper. Thanks for letting me use your room. Um, so let's start to break this down and see how you actually solve. The velocity of the bird in this 20 degrees angle um, can be broken down in the following way. Let's call this that original velocity vector. This is the 20 degrees from the horizontal. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the components of the velocity vector in the x and y directions. So I'm going to draw those like this. Here's the v sub x component. Here's the v sub y component. The v sub y component represents what my finger was doing when I was tracking the motion down. The v sub x component represents the motion as I was tracking it across the board. And so what we can do is we can actually solve for what those two components are to get the entire velocity. And we can use trigonometry to do so. So if this v here is 3.1, I can use trig to get vx and vy. So let's go ahead and set that up. 
20 degrees, this side is the adjacent side where that Vx is, so that would be the cosine of 20 equals V sub x over the hypotenuse, which is V. That V is the same as that 3.1. And so I'm going to put 3.1 on the bottom. I'm going to multiply both sides by 3.1. So I get Vx equals 3.1 cosine times 20. That's math I can do in my calculator. I'm going to put my calculator in degree mode. Okay, it's in degree mode, and then we'll run this calculation. 3.1 cosine of 20 gives us... 2.9 meters per second. Notice that is less than 3.1. That is the speed the bird travels this way. Let's go ahead and do the other one. If I look at how this all plays out, I can use the sine function to get the y direction. So the sine of 20 equals v sub y over 3.1. I can work it out in exactly the same way. and. We can get v sub y equals, let's go ahead and run that through, that'll be 3.1 times sine 20. We get 1 point, I'm going to round that to 1.1 meters per second. And so that's in the y direction how fast the bird is traveling. So those are the two speeds of this object, this bird, in the two different directions. Now, let's see what we can do with those numbers. Well, if I wanted to find out how long it takes the bird to get to the fish, I've got some interesting pieces of information here that I can use to get there. Remember that the bird will travel down this dotted line here to get to the fish. This distance here, 19.5, represents the height of the bird. As the bird moves down through this height, it will get closer and closer to approaching the water. So the question I ask myself is, what speed up here represents how fast the bird is moving in the y direction? Well, that's the vy here. So if I use this piece of information, the v sub y, and I use the height there, the distance it travels, I could find the time for the bird to travel to the water. The other thing I have to include here is that the bird is moving at a constant speed, and that limits the kinds of equations we're going to use. So let's look in the y direction. So in the y direction, I could use this equation, y equals y naught plus v naught t. This is the same as x equals x naught plus v naught t. I'm just using it in the y direction. I know what the v is in the y direction. That's hit this value right here. I know where the bird is starting. That's the 19.5 in the y direction. I know where the y is finishing. It's finishing at the bottom, or 0. And so if I plug those values in, I get 0 equals 19.5 plus 1.1 times t. I can solve this for t. Notice that I'll get uh, negative. Uh, I, I can actually make this negative because the velocity in the down direction is negative. We're going down. That's negative. I should make a little coordinate plane here to point that out. That up is positive y, to the right is positive x. That means that down is negative y, which makes this negative. And then if I subtract this over and then divide that out, I get 19.5 divided by 1.1, which gives us 17.7. So that's how many seconds it takes the bird in the y direction to get to the bottom of the, where the top of the water is. Now let's ask the question, how far does the bird travel this way? Remember, that's the same time it took the bird to get here. This time represents both how long it takes to get to the water, but also how long it takes to travel this way. And so let's go ahead and use that information in the x direction. So x direction, we'll use the x equation for constant velocity. And then let's plug in some values. X would be what we want to find. 
we're starting it off at zero. Here is the zero point. The velocity in the x direction, vx, is 2.9 times t, 17.1 seconds. That gives us a distance traveled of 2.9 times 17.1 seconds, or x will equal 49.6 meters. And that's how far the bird travels in the x direction. This is a two-dimensional problem. I want to point out that what we did was we broke the information into its x and y components and treated them independently of one another. So we solve for information in the y, we can solve for information in the x, and we can treat them separately without impacting the other direction. This is a concept called the independence of motion, which says that any directions that are perpendicular to each other are separate directions. In other words, they do not interfere with one another as we go about solving for information in the other directions. We'll talk more about this in class tomorrow. Um, all I'd like you to make sure you know well is how we got to this solution um, in this video and prepare any questions you have for class tomorrow. We'll start to dive into this in many cases like it. All right, see you then.